Today we're going to talk about uh, lighting and rendering. And in order to do that, I guess I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview regarding assignment four, kind of like we did in class. We're going to create a little globe here to, uh, to use for our lighting and rendering experiments. So to start off with, I'm going to click up here at the top, change my blender render setting to be a cycles render scene and uh, that will make it so that all the materials that I create here will work with cycles and rather than being slated for blender render I'm also going to delete this default cube I don't need that so I tap delete on my keyboard okay yes I want to delete it and it's gone so I'm going to create a UV sphere to represent the earth and you can stick with the default if you want the default settings down here we have 32 segments 16 rings a size of 1.0 I'm probably going to double that just to um, give myself a little more detail I'm going to go to 64 segments and 32 rings um, and if you zoom in on this you can see that it is flat shaded so I'll come over here to my tools menu and change that to smooth shaded and basically as far as modeling goes that's the earth it's it's just a sphere it's pretty simple so from here we move on to our materials um, settings so we're going to set this up so that it actually looks like the earth now um, I've provided some downloads in the canvas folder in class but if uh, you're picking this up on the internet and you're not part of our class you can actually go to uh, planetpixelemporium.com slash earth.html and uh, this gentleman offers a lot of um, a lot of texture maps for different planets including the earth the Earth Pack is very good. It's no longer free. Uh, when I first downloaded it, it was. Uh, but you can still download 1K versions of these textures for free. Um, if you want the large ones, he, it sounds like he needs help paying for bandwidth, so he charges for them now. But uh, class, your textures are all loaded into Canvas, so you should just go to the Files section there and download those. Moving back to Blender, uh, what I need to do now is I need to map the files onto the sphere here. So let's go over to our materials data area and we'll create a new material for this globe here. And I'm going to give this new material name, I'm going to call it Earth. Uh, since that's what it's going to be, we'll probably only really bother with uh, diffuse settings here. But obviously I don't just need a plain color I need my color information to come from something more complex so I'm going to click over here on this dot inside the square to the right of the color picker and I'm going to tell Blender that I want to use an image texture for the color information there. Now I get this little open button I can come to where I have my uh, texture files stored and there's my earthcolormap.jpg by the way if you're ever having a little trouble remembering uh, what file name is associated with which image if you have a folder full of different images like I do here you can click on this icon here for a little bit of a different view and that will show you uh, what the images look like it gives you a thumbnail so I'm going to double click on earth color map and uh, lest we be fooled into thinking that that did the job. Let's actually look at this in a rendered viewport for a minute here. You can see that currently basically that just turned the sphere blue which doesn't help at all and uh, that's because Blender doesn't know how to map this texture onto the sphere properly yet so we need to tell it. So let's click on vector here instead of default we want to tell this to generate some texture coordinates for us. So under texture coordinate choose generated and that's starting to look a little better. You can see it's still this is a little dark so it's a little hard to see. We haven't played with our light sources yet but it's still a little bit 
weird. Um, it looks like things are looking about right here, but then they get really stretchy here, and that's because the projection mode chosen is set to flat, and we need to tell it to project uh, in a spherical way. So if we do that, things start taking on the correct shapes. Now you might be asking yourself, uh, you know, we talked about UV mapping in our last tutorial. How come we're not UV mapping this? The answer to that is that when you get to the top and bottom of a sphere, UV mapping gets really complicated as far as the mechanics of getting the uh, the rectangular image to map correctly up there. So this is a much easier, more straightforward way to map a texture onto a sphere. And this is accurate, so we don't actually need to mess with UV mapping here. Now, that basically takes care of that. gives us a diffuse material for our globe. Um, just kind of to give a little more sense of place, I'm going to now create a plane you can see it's perfectly bisecting the globe there. We don't want it to do that. So I'm going to move it in the z axis by a factor of, or by a, in a val with a value of negative one. So g, z, minus one. And that puts it exactly underneath my globe. Now that's a little bit small for the surface that we want the globe to sit on, at least for my taste. So I'm going to scale this up by a factor of, let's say, 50. S50 enter and from there I'm starting to get a little bit more sense of what's going on with the lighting. You can see our shadow has some direction to it. Uh, we're still pretty small here. Now I can't actually see my light source to select it when my viewport is rendered so I could select my lamp over here just like this or I can actually um, go back just to a normal shaded viewport so that I can see my light source. What I'm going to do at this point uh, while we're demonstrating light sources is I'm going to split out my view into two parts. You don't have to do this when you're working uh, with things, but I think this will help with the demonstrations that I'm going to do. I'm going to close down my side panels on this side and change this back to a rendered viewport and then just kind of come in with a nice view nice big view of the globe, sort of the part we're concerned with. And then over here, I'll use this as my working area. Let's give ourselves a little more room there. So I have my lamp selected. You can see that it's not very bright. Uh, it's quite a ways away. Now this is what's called a, a point lamp. And basically, it just shines equally in a spherical manner. So. Uh, 360 degrees in 3D space in every direction it's going to shine uh, its light and this, in that sense it's a very simple light to kind of predict and model you know exactly what it's going to do uh, it also has the attribute of realistic light fall off decay so um, it follows the inverse square law which means that every time you double the distance from your light from your light you quadruple your light loss um, so I can actually brighten this scene up a little just by moving the light closer. So let's grab this light in the z-axis, bring it down, and you can see that, yeah, that gets a little more visible there. It's still not great, but the shadows lengthened a little. Also, we need to come over here under our light data. Since we have that selected, we have the ability to change the data for the light here, and we need to tell this to use nodes. Okay, We want to deal with this within the... Uh, within the power of the cycles renderer. So uh, we have the ability to turn off the cast shadows from this light. You can see that that makes it so that there is no cast shadow from the earth. Uh, there's still a shaded side, but it's not casting a shadow. Uh, the application for that really isn't this particular scenario. We don't, uh, we actually want to cast shadow, so I'm going to turn that back on. Um, we also have the ability to change the size of the light. Now I'm going to turn the power of the light up, the strength, sorry, um, before we do that so we can see a little better what's going on. So I'm going to multiply that by 6. Let's go to a strength of about 600. Okay, and that's starting to look 
you know, a little more reasonable. Actually, I might even take it up a little more than that. Maybe, maybe about 900. Yeah, and that's kind of nice. But um, the size of the light source. Now, you'll notice that if I change this value, this doesn't seem to get any bigger. Um, what the, the reason we're concerned with the size of a light source, as any photographer can tell you, is that is actually, it's the relative size of a light source that determines how hard and soft the edges of shadows are. So that's sometimes referred to as the quality of the light uh, in photographic circles. So if I increase the size here, the edges of this shadow are going to start blurring more. You can see as they get farther away from the earth here, they blur and they kind of sharpen as we get close. So if I increase the size of this quite drastically, then it acts like a more diffused light. Um, and it looks a little more probably studio-ish. Um, because that's what we tend to do with studio lights in photography. We tend to, to diffuse them for the most part. We, we shoot with soft boxes and umbrellas and things to diffuse the light, which basically what, what we mean by diffuse is we spread out the light source through a larger area. So that's kind of what that's doing. That's why we have that parameter there, the size. Uh, and that's a really excellent control to understand because that can change a lot about the look of your of your uh, image. Now on a sphere, that uh, that's not really going to showcase you know the huge differences that this value can make in the aesthetics of your image. But if you have something more complex like a humanoid character or something like that, then that becomes a really big deal. Um, the last thing we want to deal with in terms of this particular light is obviously we can change the color. So we have a color picker here and uh, you know we can make it a very cold or a very warm light. We can make this look like it's you know underneath a street light in, in uh, a city or something. Or we can just kind of keep it straight white and that's a little hard to click there but you can just change the RGB values all to one and it will go back to a pure white light. So let's leave it there for now, but understand that you can change that. Okay, and obviously we can introduce multiple light sources at any time. Over here under our Create menu, or with Shift A, we can create lamps. We have a point lamp, a sun lamp, a spot lamp, hemispherical lamp, and an area lamp. Now let's go through and talk about what each of those are and what they do. Right now we're using a point lamp. We've kind of covered what that is and how it behaves. So if we zoom out here, you can see that directly under the point lamp we have kind of this nice bright bloom of light and that light spreads out in every direction. As a matter of fact, if we were to select this plane and duplicate it in the z-axis, then you can see that as we put our view between the planes that it's shining upward just as, as, mu as much as it is downward. Okay, So that's something to take into account. You may not want light on the ceiling uh, if you're trying to construct a room here. You may, uh, you may want things a little more controlled than that. So let's delete that second plane and select our light again. Now the next type of light that we're going to talk about, I'm not going to go in order here. Um, let's talk about a spotlight next. Because a spotlight for the most part is going to have, uh, you know, it's going to behave fairly similarly uh, in that it also has, it, it models uh, realistic light decay and it uses the inverse square law. Uh, the difference is that it's very directional and just like a real spotlight, it projects its light out in a cone shape. And that cone is visible. Uh, let's go into wireframe mode here. There we can see that a little better. That cone is visible in the, uh, in the modeling view here, in the 3D view. So I'm going to move that out a little bit and we can actually, we, this size parameter here under spot shape, 
uh, you'll notice that that's delineated in degrees and that narrow allows us to narrow or broaden that cone so I'm going to narrow it you can see that we're starting to get dark here why is that that's because I moved the light source farther away so let's look at a couple different views and make sure that we're aimed about right here let's see we're in a perspective viewport there let's go to orthographic and looks to me like we're aimed right at it so there we go so we've moved our light source farther away um, and that has basically made it dimmer so let's uh, let's increase the power there I'm gonna put that up to maybe 5,000 and you can see that that brings the power up a little bit eh, maybe some more let's go 9,000 there that's kind of nice so that's what that size parameter does and uh, the blend here controls basically how sharp your edges the edges of your cone are now, I don't tend to get very picky about that one but once again we have a size parameter here and I can sharpen the shadows of this by increasing or decreasing that parameter so we have a nice sharp shadow here sort of like you would on a real stage um, again you have the ability to turn on or off the cast shadows from this particular light so you could make I guess a vampire globe really easily if you wanted there uh, is it shadows vampires don't cast or reflections or something anyway I'm not really into that but uh, but uh, you can you can turn that on or off so <laughs> there you go um, so that's basically what a spotlight does and um, you know it it's in other ways it's very similar to a point lamp it just doesn't shine in all directions it can be controlled very very precisely so that can be a good way to model for instance car headlights or something like that or or an actual spotlight if you're uh, modeling something that needs to be on a stage Okay, the next light we're going to talk about is an area light. And an area light is kind of cool. If we zoom way in on it over here in our 3D view, you can see that it has this square border. And what that does basically, that that border acts like the size or that border kind of tells us the size. So if we change the size here, that will be reflected by that square shape here. Now this is square, but our shape is actually set to be a rectangle, which basically just means we can control the X and the Y size independent of one another. So you can see kind of how those work. Um, if you don't want to worry about that, you can just tell, you know what, I just want it to be a square, give me one size parameter, and assume that I want it to be symmetrical all the way around. So I can change the size, and it will, once again, uh, affect the softness of the shadows. Now the power on that is I'd say a little too high. Let's put that down to 5,000. Let's say 2,500. There we go. That's a good size right there. So you can see that this light is also directional in nature. It has this line that kind of shows us where it's aiming. Uh, we've aimed it right at our globe. Um, so that's uh, a big difference between this and a point light, point lamp, um, is that this is not going to shine in all directions. So if we zoom out here, you can see that there's this kind of hard line behind which all we're really picking up is basically a little bit of reflected light. We're not, uh, our light is not shining directly on it. So that's kind of the big difference with an area lamp. Once again, we can turn on or off the ability to cast shadows. We can play with the size. We can make this a really massive light, giving off a diffused sort of very soft shadows. Or we can turn it way down, and, uh, and we can make the edges of the shadows quite hard. So that's, uh, that's kind of a nice way to look at things there. Um, so a hemispherical light, I'm not going to really cover because uh, when you click on that, Blender basically says it's not supported and it's interpreted as a sun lamp. 
Now, it does seem to me that it behaves a little bit differently, but uh, I'll, I guess I'll take their word for it for now. You can kind of... A, a hemispherical light is actually sort of meant to fake environmental lighting, and with the Cycles render, Renderer, you can actually do um, real environmental lighting. So it's kind of... We don't really need to go there as far as hemispherical lamps. Oh, one more thing about the area lamp. Uh, you can also check this box on an area lamp uh, portal, and you can see everything went dark there. Basically, what that checkbox does is it tells Blender, you know what, I don't actually want this uh, lamp to be a light source. I just want you to send more rays there when you're when you're tracing the paths of rays for your cycles render. Uh, when you're tracing the paths, I want you to send more rays in the direction of this area lamp that is actually just a portal. Uh, so, for instance, if you're modeling like a room, a closed room, and you want Blender to pay more attention to the light source that's coming from outside of an actual hole in the wall of the room, or, or a window, or a doorway, or something, uh, it'll do that, and that tends to generate a lot less noise if your sample rate is low. Um, when you're rendering. So that's kind of a nice trick. Uh, it probably won't really come up in the course of our class, but that's what that's for. So let's turn to a sun lamp. Now you'll notice when I change this lamp into a sun lamp, it kind of has this neat little sun look to it, but everything got really, really bright. Um, the reason that happened is that a sun lamp does not uh, model uh, decay or light fall off. It does not use the inverse square law. Um, that's because on Earth, even though the light from the sun does experience the inverse square law, for instance, you double your distance from the sun, you will quadruple your light loss from it. But the diameter or the circumference of Earth is so small compared to the amount of, of uh, space that the light from the sun has actually traveled through to get to us that we will never be able to travel to an appreciable amount of inverse square law decay in the light of the sun. So from our perception, the sun is basically a non-decaying light source. So if, we're, if we want our lamp to act like the sun does on Earth, you check that box and it does not decay. So um, suddenly our strength of 2500 is really, really bright on our globe model because uh, it every pixel here is lit as if the sun lamp here were perfectly next to it, exactly mathematically next to it, uh, because there is no fall off. So we can turn the strength on that way down. Let's put it to about two, maybe four. There, that's a nice bright sunny day. Um, so the position of the sun lamp also doesn't matter. The position does not matter, but the direction does. So rotation, yeah, that, that'll that make a big difference. Um, but, like I say, its position doesn't matter. So you can simulate the rising and setting of the sun if you wanted to animate the rotation of this uh, particular light, but yeah, even if I put this below the ground plane, you can see uh, it's not actually visible in the model anymore because it's below there, but it's still casting its light. That's because the only thing this pays attention to is direction. It is this kind of omnipresent skylight, basically. It acts like a sun. Again, we have the same kind of parameters. We can choose whether or not to cast a shadow. Uh, we can choose the strength and, of course, the color. You know, we can we can make it maybe a little more sunset or sunrise light. We can warm it up a little bit. Or we can just leave it as pure white light. And uh, those are basically the types of light sources that we have. So that's kind of how to deal with lights. Um, let's uh, Let's go back to an area lamp. I find those to be pretty versatile. And I'm going to set up a really basic three-point lighting setup. Now, in uh, three-point lighting, you've got 
three lights. Uh, you've got a key light, you've got a fill light, and you've got a backlight. And I'll set each one of those up and kind of explain what they are. I'm going to use area lamps uh, because I like the ability to kind of see how large they are and I like the ability to control their direction. So I have one light in here already, one lamp, and I can name it, I'll call it key. So that's, uh, that's, oh, did I just, I did, I named the, I put that in the wrong parameter, sorry. So let's uh, go to the object data here and rename that key. And just to be thorough, let's call it key lamp. There we go. Back to its settings. So from a top view, basically my camera's here. I'm going to light this globe from the left a little bit. Left from camera left. And uh, move this down a little closer. Kind of aim it right at my globe. I'm pretty happy with that but obviously the power is way down. So let's turn that up. About 2,000 seems good. I'm going to change the size so I get a little bit softer shadows from this. So let's, there we go, about five looks good. That's kind of a nice soft shadow, but it's still specific enough that we can see it's there. And you know, I might actually even turn that light up a lot. So a key lamp basically is your, a key light is your primary light source in three-point lighting, it's, you're basically saying with your key light, this is what I want primarily illuminated. So now I'm casting a shadow on the other side. So I need another light here. And my fill light is what we're going to call this. Basically what it does is it is not to eliminate shadows. Its purpose is just to darken or to lighten shadows. So if I, I want shadows for sure because that's what describes a shape when we're representing 3D space in a two-dimensional media like a screen or, or something printed. So I want those shadows, um, but I don't necessarily want them that dark. So a fill light is what does the trick there. Let's go to a top view. Shift D will duplicate my lamp here. I can aim it from over here. You can see that that's pretty uniform. I need to turn this light down now. So let's take that down to about 1500 you can see that I still have a shadow here, but it's a little lighter. So that's kind of nice. And I'm going to take that down even more. I, I maybe want my shadows a little bit deeper. I'm going to cut that in half. There we go. So I've got a shadow, but it's not a pitch black shadow. Maybe aim that just a little better. There we go. Um, before we go any farther, actually, one thing that I hadn't done yet is I've got my key lamp, I've got my fill lamp, and uh, I need to rename that object. So instead of key lamp.001, since I, I created it by duplicating my key lamp, I'm just going to name this fill lamp so that I can keep track of where things are. And actually, now that I look at it with maybe a second pair of eyes, I might turn that down even further just to darken the shadows. You don't, again, you don't want shadows to go away. They're, they are what you use to describe a shape in two-dimensional media. So we want those shadows um, a little bit. All right, so next step, final step, we need to create our backlight. So in order, that's, uh, that basically needs to be a rim light from the perspective of the camera. So I'm going to tap zero on my numpad to look through my camera here. And let's actually get this camera into the position that we want it in. So if I select the camera, um, I can manipulate that by grabbing it with a G key, or I can rotate it with the R key. But my favorite way to move the camera around is actually to hit Shift F on the keyboard. And that kind of lets me free look with the mouse then just like in a lot of video games, W will move me forward, A moves me backward, and, or sorry, S moves me backward, and A and D move me left to right. So I can kind of frame things up fairly nicely there. And that looks pretty good. So I just click to commit to that position. 
and then from here I need to create my third lamp. Now for this third lamp I think I want to use a spot lamp um, because I don't want it to be quite as general as these other lamps. Even though they are directional I want to be able to control where this shines a little more carefully. So my spot lamp is probably yep, existing right in the middle of the globe so Let's move that up in the z-axis just a little bit. You can see I've started to get a little ring of light here. Let's, uh, let's narrow the cone somewhat. And actually, uh, there we go. Let's look at this from our camera perspective over here as well so we can see a little better what we're doing. And let's brighten that up just to give us a little better idea, maybe even brighter than we want it. And you know what actually can be really handy is if I want to solve for just this one variable, it would really help me to get rid of these other two lights. So let's select the key in the fill lamp momentarily, and if I tap M on the keyboard, it will ask me what layer do you want to move those to? And that's what these are down here. These are representative of the layers that I'm looking at. So tap M and I'm going to move them to layer 2. That basically just leaves me for the moment with my spot lamp and its effects on my scene. So I'm going to go into my front view again and basically move this thing. Whoops, I need to select it again. So spot, let's go ahead and rename that while we're here as well. Back lamp. So I'm going to move that backward so that I'm just getting this nice kind of sliver of light up here. And uh, let's see, let's uh, move that in the z-axis to kind of get rid of that spill off onto the, onto the floor. Maybe move it forward just a little bit. And you can see that I'm basically moving it either directly toward or directly away from the camera. That's in essence how these particular kinds of lights work. I might want it a little more uh, toward the side, toward the shaded side. And then maybe we'll narrow our cone even more to once again get rid of that spill off onto the floor. You don't want light down there. And that actually looks pretty good. That's basically what I need a back lamp to be doing. So if I go down and look at layer two here, now I can grab those two lamps that I banished to the outer limits and tap M on the keyboard and move them back to layer one. And you don't have to do that, but that's just kind of how, uh, that's a helpful tool for me in this particular scenario, just to know how layers work. And that's actually looking about like I want it to look. So you know what, I might darken my fill lamp even more. Let's take it down to about 250 so that we get a little more shadow. And let's maybe even brighten our key lamp just a touch. There we go. Okay, so as far as rendering goes, we, uh, we have our lights in place now. And we have our camera in position, so rendering is actually a pretty simple proposition. I'm going to collapse this other window here. Um, so this is a rendered viewport. If I go to the render tab over here, then under sampling, there's a very, very, very important setting, and that is the number of samples. So my preview samples are set to 32. You can see that this is tracing sample 30 of 32. What that means is that for every visible pixel here uh, in my rendered viewport, Blender is sending out 32 kind of semi-random uh, rays or paths to see if there is a light visible to that pixel and then it, if there is a light source or a reflected light source or something then it calculates how bright that pixel should be based on the parameters, the color, and, and uh, the shaders and material that I've given it. Um, when you only have 32 samples per pixel, 
sometimes you will hit a light source and sometimes you won't. So that's why some of these pixels in here appear to disagree with their neighbors. That's basically what that noise is. Uh, there wasn't, weren't enough samples there to really get an accurate, a good, it, it's like sending out a survey. You know, the more people you survey, the more confident you can be in your results. So increasing our samples there so uh, will actually help us to get a smoother, more consistent result. So the render samples are set to 128, and that's probably a pretty good number. Um, there are a couple of other settings here to pay attention to when rendering a still. Our output, if we want our, our image to go straight to a folder, we can pick that folder here. We can pick the format that we want to render out in. I really like PNG um, because it is lossless compression. Uh, right now we're set to render an alpha channel even though everything in this scene is opaque. So we could actually just pick RGB and be just fine here. Um, our resolution we're set to render 1920 pixels in the x-axis by 1080 pixels in the y-axis, so that's basically an HDTV. But we're only currently set to render 50% of that resolution. That's a scale. So if we don't want to be recalculating the ratio every time, we can just scale it up and down really easily like this. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I see my students make is they'll leave this at 50% when they're supposed to be rendering 100% of that size. So let's increase that. And from there, basically, uh, we are already set to render the camera here. So if we just click render, then this will take a minute, but it will actually render a pretty nice image of what we have created here. Now since I don't have uh, since I don't have a specific output directory, it's just set to this temp folder, uh, what I like to do after this finishes rendering is I'll go down to the image menu here and just click on save as image and then I can save the render result. But this right now gives me a chance to kind of look and say, yeah, that looks the way I wanted it to. I can see my rim light that I set up. That looks pretty good. Things here are basically, I'm pretty happy with how they've come out. You can see that a sampling of 128 is still, there's some coarseness to it. So for a production, a production level render, you would probably want a sample rate much higher than that. But this will work for now and uh, it actually looks pretty decent. So if I spotted some sort of problem that I, I was unhappy with the render for some reason here, um, and I didn't want to sit and wait through this entire render process, I could just hit the escape key at any time, and it would allow me to uh, stop the render in progress and go back and work on it and then I could restart that render later using of course the same dialog over here. So if you wait for just a second then that will finish rendering and those outer edges probably won't take too long they're not terribly complicated and there we go. So that's our render. I would now go to the image menu down here click save as image and I could give this thing a name, so globe, whoop, globe test render dot png. And I have the same options here, RGB, RGBA, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to save that out, but I just hit escape, and I get back to my work area here. Now, here's one other thing I want you to know about rendering. So in terms of alpha channels, let's say, let's uh, delete this ground plane here. And let's say I wanted to render out a, a picture of this Earth with an alpha channel. Um, obviously, I would need this setting to be on RGBA, but that's actually not enough. The other thing I need to do is I need to come down here to the film pull down. And it's got this little checkbox that says transparent. If I check that, then you can see suddenly we have the familiar black and white or uh, gray and dark gray checkerboard back here that denotes that there is a transparency there. So at this point if I were to render out and save my image with it as an RGBA PNG 
then it would give me a PNG with transparency that I could then uh, put onto a letterhead or, or composite somewhere else quite easily. It would be anti-aliased. It would be a really nice asset to work with. So basically, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of rendering 101, and I hope this helps, and I will see you in class. Thanks.